I'd like to welcome you to our service that has been recorded for uh, Sunday morning, 16 August 2020. A warm welcome to all who are watching and listening and really participating with us as we worship our wonderful Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, together. Uh, what a previous week it has been uh, when our church was uh, able to, uh, to minister to a grieving family and also to have a Thanksgiving service and a funeral uh, for one of our uh, uh, beloved uh, members of our church. And uh, it was my joy to uh, share with uh, those who gathered at the funeral, though they're only a handful, as I mentioned uh, to you earlier, uh, the singing was very good for a handful of people, and uh, the Lord was glorified. And uh, one thing that I just wanted to share with you very briefly as we think about worship today and prepare our hearts is that whenever the uh, whenever a believer goes from earth up to glory, whenever their journey, this, their pilgrim journey comes to a conclusion, uh, something very significant is happening. Now, it's not simply that, uh, or only that, they are going to be with their Lord. But what we have is a, a gradual uh, a reunion and reconciliation of all of God's people with their Savior, Jesus Christ. In John 17, known as the high priestly prayer of Christ, because it seems that what we're hearing Christ pray to the Father in John 17 uh, may be very accurate glimpses of how he prays to him uh, and how he seeks him uh, as he makes intercession for the saints, I should say, according to God's will. But in John 17, uh, Jesus prayed in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. And so every time a believer goes from earth to heaven, uh, that, that prayer of Jesus Christ to the Father back 2,000 years ago is being answered. Uh, every time a believer escapes the clutches of this uh, dying, decaying, corrupted, curse-ridden world, uh, they are wonderfully transformed and taken into the very presence of God. Uh, think about all of the stadiums around the world, all the concert halls that are empty, empty. And yet, and yet, the, uh, the stadiums of heaven, as it were, the great gathering places of God's people are teeming with redeemed saints from every tongue, tribe, kindred, and nation, uh, innumerable angels and heavenly hosts. Uh, well, one of our loved ones has joined that host and uh, is participating in that unending praise service, that praise concert to Christ, and uh, that endless loving service for him. And so uh, we, we don't pray for the dead at Open Door Baptist Church. We pray for ourselves. <laughs> we pray for others that are with us still, uh, those that have gone on to be with the Lord are uh, in his presence and enjoying uh, wonderful fellowship with the Lamb forever and ever. And so I trust that might cheer your hearts today. Uh, just a few announcements. We'll have an evening service that will be uh, available this evening, uh, continuing uh, our series in Psalm 139. Uh, we will let you know about any uh, further um, uh, Skype meetings for, for our ladies and having our regular uh, prayer meetings. And uh, we're also recording Explorer messages. You might know some people that have children, primary age children, that would, would benefit from hearing God's word and really a gospel challenge regularly. Uh, and so keep those ministries in prayer. And uh, for those who are um, not well anyway and uh, need some treatment or tests uh, for our missionaries that we support in different and trying places. And so would you join with me now uh, in a word of prayer to our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time this morning. We thank you for our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that wonderful record of his communication, his communion with the Father back there in John 17. 
and his prayer that each one, each child of God, given, given by the Father to the Son in eternity past, will, will be uh, gathered to be with Father and Son and Spirit in heaven. And uh, each time a believer is promoted to glory, that prayer is being gradually answered. And so uh, we rejoice that a loved one's sufferings have been brought to an end. And uh, our sorrow, as Paul tells the Thessalonians, is not as those who have no hope. Our sorrow is, is uh, tempered by truths. And our mourning and grief is, is lessened. And the burden is carried uh, because of the wonderful heavenly realities that you give to us in your holy word. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul says it is far better that way to be with Christ. And Lord, we can still fellowship with you today. We can still know you and love you and serve you. Uh, Lord, though we have indwelling sin and that perpetual indwelling distraction and detraction from our knowledge of you. And so help us to mortify the flesh, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh and mind, and to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, those whom we love, those whom we support. Uh, Lord, we have missionaries in, in India, PNG. Uh, we have missionaries that serve in Australia. We have those serving in parts of Africa uh, and elsewhere, Mauritius. Lord, our hearts go out, particularly for a few of them who are battling uh, discouragements, battling recurring diseases, needing deep treatments, and we commit them to you. May their hearts be drawn to you today. And may you answer these prayers on our behalf toward them and uh, give them the joy of, of, of serving you today in whatever capacity they are able to. Uh, Lord, we are in a, in a place, in a part of Australia that have been particularly impacted by further lockdowns and restrictions. Lord, may we have the heart of Joseph who, <clears throat> though in, in prison, literally, literally, was still able to serve you. And Lord, these lockdowns are no excuse for us to check out or to churn off or to slacken off. Uh, rather, there are other areas of service we've never thought of before, perhaps, where we can serve you with our hearts. And so open up those doors for us uh, each day. Uh, Lord, we think of families that have been impacted with their work, their employment, where work is getting harder, where uh, work has to be put off, delayed for weeks or months. Lord, meet their needs. Lord, help them, whether through ordinary ways or extraordinary provision. Lord, whatever they need, would you meet that need, uh, Lord, because they are your children. And you've promised, as they seek your kingdom first, all the things we need will be added to us. Uh, Father, we pray for those who are trying to get home from far-flung places. Uh, Lord, may they be able to avoid exorbitant uh, travel expenses to get home. May governments look upon them kindly and fairly uh, that they could be back with their loved ones in your perfect timing. Uh, Father, we do ask that this service would bring glory to you as the word of God is rehearsed again and explained and as songs of the faith are sung to you. Uh, Lord, may the Lord Jesus Christ be praised even through these means and for your glory. And we prayed in his precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen.
scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 41 reading from verse 46 to the end of the chapter Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh king of Egypt and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt now in the seven plentiful years the ground brought forth abundantly so he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. In the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, because the famine was severe in all lands.
things that my eyes cannot see. I'll never fear, for the Savior is near, my Lord abides with me. bring a further message to you this morning from Genesis chapter 41. Uh, last week, when we looked at this first part of this chapter, we saw Joseph going from the prison to the palace. Certainly it was the greatest political promotion in history. Within, within hours, Joseph is a forgotten prisoner to second under the most powerful ruler in all of the known world. And I've called this morning's message Forgotten Afflictions. Forgotten Afflictions. And just a little bit of recap as we approach the, uh, the, the, the second part of Genesis 41, which takes up the last 10 or so verses of that chapter which comprised our Bible reading. Uh, Joseph uh, is first introduced to us in Genesis as a 17-year-old young man. And uh, by the time we get to Genesis 41, he is now 30. He had been in uh, Egypt for some 13 years, and uh, quite a number of those years in, in prison and also in Potiphar's house. We're not sure what the exact division of years or service was. And we know that Joseph uh, is sold as a slave by his brothers, but he carries with him the promise of the dreams that uh, the sun, moon, and stars would bow down to his star, the sheaves of wheat would bow down to his sheaf, and, sheaf, and this, these, these dual dreams had one fulfillment, that his family would uh, one day recognize his own spiritual ascendancy and uh, kind of patriarchy. Well, for all those years... That dream seemed impossible, seemed impossible. But you get to Genesis 41, and with Joseph's promotion to second under Pharaoh, all of a sudden, that dream of, of his family back in Canaan bowing down to him seemed modest and small. The dream doesn't seem that big anymore. Uh, Joseph is second in charge to the world's greatest known leader of the time. And so God does do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Joseph is now the, the prime minister the, to the king, you must say. 
And even Pharaoh gives tribute to Joseph's God. He, he, he asks the question in verse 38, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And then he says to Joseph in verse 39, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. And then he sets Joseph over Egypt. Pharaoh affirms that there is a God greater than him and greater than all the gods of Egypt because this God can tell the future. He can't. His gods can't. His entourage of wise men and advisors, they can't, but Joseph's God can. And so Joseph is going to be put in charge of one of the greatest planning and administration rescue missions of the ancient world. This will take years in the planning. It will have its disappointments, its mistakes. Joseph will have to deal with a large Egyptian workforce of pagans. But it is a rescue mission. And God will bless him. God will energize his efforts as he laboriously works to save Egypt. Pharaoh is obviously not in control of Egypt. God is. Let me read to you again the quote from Walter Brueggemann, because if you haven't, or I haven't got it yet, we need to get this truth that our own leaders, as well-intentioned as they are, have limited resources, they're working with other human beings, and they are not, nor ever have been, in full control. Brueggemann says the future in Egypt does not depend upon Pharaoh. He does not get to decide. In fact, Pharaoh is irrelevant and marginal to the future of the kingdom. I mean, would it not be very rude for a journalist to um, to finger any you, know, you think of any any political leader and say, "Listen, Mr. President, Mrs. Prime Minister." whatever country you want to think of and say, do you know you're irrelevant to your country? <laughs> do you know you're not in control? Well, that was the position Pharaoh was in. Joseph Brueggemann says, has calmly announced to the Lord of Egypt that the future is out of his hands. It is clear that Pharaoh can cause no future. No human can cause the future to happen maybe there is some influence there but we can't cause anything nor can he resist the future that god will bring yes there is a future that god is ushering in there is a wonderful eternal kingdom he is certainly ushering in and no man no army no government can stop that three times in chapter 41 joseph testifies of god's ability to know dreams and thus the future Genesis 41 is affirming God's foreknowledge of the future. And not simply, not simply that, that, that God is simply aware of the future, but he will bring to pass the future. I mean, you and I can wake up with not enough sleep and we, you know, we can kind of know it's not going to be a great day. <laughs> You know, mere knowledge doesn't mean that we're in full control. But God, God, not only knows, but he also plans. He takes into account our actions and our decisions for good or, for good or ill. They are not discounted. They are not discounted. But God will always get the upper hand in history. And so what Pharaoh does is Pharaoh publicly installs Joseph, he installs Joseph in verse 42. He gives him his signet ring. He clothes him in wonderful garments, royal garments. He is put on the second chariot we call the second limo. <laughs> the second limo. Think about the limousine that maybe the president of the U.S. has and think of the, pre the, the, the limo for the vice president. Because the vice president is important, not just because he's second in charge, but because if something happens to the president, he, he, he is then in charge. So Joseph's in the second chariot. And all the Egyptians cry out as they 
as, as his chariot rides past, they bow the knee. And Joseph is set over all of Egypt. All of Egypt knows. Incredible. Incredible. Pharaoh's signet ring bore his name and could be used to sign and seal documents and orders and laws. Joseph could go about making decisions in Pharaoh's name. He had so much authority. In fact, Pharaoh says in verse 44, he says to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Think about that raw display of power. I am Pharaoh. You know, there's another I am in the Old Testament, and it ain't Pharaoh. It's the I am who appeared to Moses at the burning bush, the eternal God. But Pharaoh says, I am Pharaoh. He must have loved saying that. And without your consent, no man, no person may lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Think about that raw power Joseph has. Now, Joseph thus has the power of life and death in Egypt. You know, if you were, if you were Potiphar's wife, wouldn't you be feeling a little bit nervous? Maybe, maybe even Potiphar. I mean, he certainly spared Joseph's life, but he, you know, put him in prison. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Joseph can go on a revenge spree. A revenge spree. He could take out Potiphar's house. He could take out that, that butler that had forgotten him for two years. Could he not? I mean, anyone that had slighted him, that had, that had laughed at him in prison as this worthless Hebrew. Anyone that had treated him badly in all those years, he could have just told his servants, look, grab that person. They're dead by sunset. Joseph has incredible power. It says a lot about per a person, the way they use power, does it not? How do people use power when they have it? And when people have un, when people have power that has no checks and balances, much like the ancient world rulers did, uh, human sinfulness and pride come to the fore, and that power is often misapplied and misused. So there'd be a, there'd be some people in Egypt not sleeping that well when they hear about Joseph's incredible promotion. And we have the further uh, Egyptianization of, of Joseph. Look at verse 45. It says, When Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zaphnath Paniah, so he's given uh, an Egyptian name, and that means God speaks and lives. God speaks and lives. Though it's an Egyptian name, it, it, it's certainly a reference to Joseph's guide. So he's given an Egyptian name, and he's also given an Egyptian wife. It says he gave him as a wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Uh, his wife was from an aristocratic, priestly family. This is a, this is a power couple. We hear about power couples today. From influential families. Now, of course, Joseph's family's back in back in Canaan, but Joseph is next to next under Pharaoh, and so he's given a wife from a very powerful aristocracy. He's been almost completely Egyptianized. So here's the question for us today: Will his faith stand this test of prosperity? Because up to this point. Joseph knows a whole lot about suffering and injustice and betrayal and humility and prison food. I mean, this prosperity thing, this honor, this being treated nicely. I mean, having people bow down to you like you are some sort of demigod. Can he handle that? His life has been completely changed for the earthly, for his earthly good. He has complete power. He has the best clothes, opulent living, no doubt a very beautiful wife. Can this man take all these things? Can he take the blessings? I mean, could you imagine waking up 
tomorrow and you go, you go into your net banking account and the 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 uh, the, the money in your account has you know someone's added five or six zeros to it <laughs> and there's a few new cars out the front and if you're a kid you know there's every there's every um there's every xbox and uh nintendo switch whatever that you want and it's all sitting for you ready to go and everyone's serving you and all of a sudden you're the most important person in the room can joseph take this it's a good question will this be his personal and spiritual ruin remember he's only 30 he's only 30 you know, most people come into this kind of influence and wealth you know, a little bit later in life, unless, of course, you're Pharaoh's son. But you know, for most of us, the comforts of life come a little bit later after you've had a lifetime of working. But Joseph's riches and honor and power and glory come very, very quickly. Is it too much for him to take? Think about how many sports people, movie stars and others have come to fame even in their 20s and yet by their 30s even or 40s their life has been utterly ruined they had way too much money it's been way too much free time way too many adoring fans way too many yes people around them will prosperity kill joseph will that get him because at the moment satan hasn't been able to discourage him through all of these trials and difficulties but prosperity might do it prosperity might get him Well, in verse 46, verse 46, Joseph is now 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh. And Joseph goes out from the presence of Pharaoh. He goes throughout all the land. He gets very busy. He is Pharaoh's appointed fix-it man. He's the one Pharaoh appoints to get things done and moving. And, and the, the scripture tells us in verse 47 that that in these seven years the ground brings forth abundantly now remember joseph's plan is that for the next seven years they're going to save 20 percent, so that when the bad years come they'll have enough grain to feed everyone okay now when you do the maths 20 percent of seven is not going to last the next seven years is it but but here's here's the difference and i answer that because my son asked me that he said dad they're only saving 20% per year for seven. How's that going to feed them in the next seven years? Well, here's, here's, here's how it works. These were seven awesome years. These were seven super years. These were seven super abundantly awesome years. Incredible prosperity. Amazing prosperity. I mean, think, think of the amazing wealth of Solomon that just exploded during his reign. This is what was going on with Joseph. So these are seven amazingly incredible, fruitful, bountiful, abundant years. I think you get the picture now. A lot is happening. And so they lay out the food in every city. So it's not centralized. Uh, think of the explosion in Lebanon, in Beirut. Do you know what was right near uh, the... The, uh, the port and the docks, about 85% of, of, of Lebanon's grain supply in silos, and that was destroyed. Uh, this poor country needs our prayers because all of the, all of the grain was in one place. Well, that, might, that sort of sounds great. We all know where it is, but it's not good if it, if it gets impacted. And so Joseph has grain stored right throughout the city so that it's not centralized. People don't have to travel as far to get it, take it home. This is a great plan. I mean, how much how much abundance is there? Well, verse 49 tells us that Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea. And, and think about the promises to Abraham. Abraham's seed would be like the sand of the sea, the stars in the sky. They gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. It was just too much. <laughs> immeasurable everywhere you looked <laughs> there were these grain silos full to overflowing 
the blessings came thick and fast. And here, here's the thing, right? You get seven years of incredible growth and abundance. You know what, you know what Egyptians tend to think? Or anyone would, would tend to think if you were in the Egyptian population? Is the famine really coming? Is the famine really coming? I mean, we've had seven amazing years. How could, how could the good times not keep coming? Maybe Joseph's God changed his mind. He must love Joseph and maybe he'll just forget about that, that famine that, that Joseph gave the interpretation to of the dream. Maybe people are thinking, well, maybe those seven bad years won't come after all. Maybe we're just going to have good times. No bad times come in, the, in a fallen world as we know. Who, who would have believed last year? Who would have believed? Who would have believed that we would be where we are today? Well, Joseph has done a lot of living by the time he hits 30 when he begins his reign under Pharaoh. And uh, at, the, at uh, the end of those seven years, now he is 37. Uh, King David had a similar roller coaster ride before he took the kingdom at the age of 30. Now, Joseph's uh, work those first seven years for Pharaoh, this incredible abundance of harvest, uh, is even more remarkable because Egypt had little direct rainfall. I mean, it famously gets very little rain. Uh, agriculturally, Joseph had challenges. The country relied upon floods that came from the distant rainfall, actually in the upper Nile. And so they were reliant on rain coming from other places. And God wonderfully, even miraculously, provided. God blessed his diligence. And so, so far, so good for Joseph. And then if you look at verse 50, verse 50, it says, Joseph, uh, had, he had two sons during the years, sorry, before the years of famine. So in that seven-year period of abundance, God abundantly gives Joseph two sons to his wife, Asenath, daughter of Potiphar. Well, what does he call his sons? Of, you know, often in Bible times, uh, sons and daughters were given names a, 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 as a testimony of what God had done in the life of the parents or the broader family. Joseph calls the name of the firstborn Manasseh, which means forgetfulness. Why does he call Manasseh? For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Well, he has another son, Ephraim, in verse 52, it means basically fruitful, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, here's why these two names are very significant. It answers the question, was Joseph spiritually corrupted by his great promotion? I mean, his naming of his sons answer the question, how is Joseph doing spiritually? How is he going with this incredible abundance? Well, his the naming of his sons is, is a testimony of where Joseph is at, what Joseph is thinking. And for each of his sons, he mentions what God is doing in his life. That's remarkable. Joseph now has a family of his own. He's got his own little family, two boys. This must have been a wonderful comfort as his much-loved father and brother Benjamin are, in, uh, are, are a long way away. He has not seen them for many years. In fact, he hasn't seen them for some 20 years when you get to the seven-year point, the very end of those good seven years. 20 years by that point. Think about these two names. Manasseh, God's caused me to forget my suffering. And Ephraim, fertile, fruitful. He's made me fruitful in my affliction. In these two names, these two names, there is a whole lot of truth. I mean, we can go to many places in the New Testament to learn about God's purposes for suffering. And we ought to go there. God's given us First Peter. It's, it's a little book that its main theme is dealing with the sufferings of life. From... from from the writing of Peter, First Peter. But what Joseph does is, he, he is teaching us, really, what God does, 
or what God intends for us to do in our suffering. Our suffering is temporary. God's going to help us forget. One day, we're going to be able to permanently, permanently be removed from those areas of legitimate suffering. But then there's also fruitfulness, Ephraim, fruitfulness. God, God desires for us, he expects us to bear fruit for him, to show Christ-likeness, to be spiritually active, to bring God glory even in those trials. And I might also add, though Joseph has an Egyptian name and his wife, uh, you know, obviously she's got this wonderful, wonderful Egyptian name, he gives his sons Hebrew names. Hebrew names. Probably the only two boys in all of Egypt. They're virtually Egyptian royalty now. And they have Hebrew names. That's a public testimony, is it not? That's a public testimony of God and what he's done for him. You know, this. it is not too much to say. Not too much to say that Joseph would have had a great spiritual influence on his wife, his Egyptian bride. It's hard not to see her being drawn to Joseph's God. But we don't actually know. But certainly as a father, he is giving his sons Hebrew names and, and teaching them, even by their very name, that their father knows the true and living God, though he is a long way from his birthplace. Manasseh, God's made me forget. Ephraim, fruitfulness. You know what God gives to us in trials? He gives us his grace and he gives us the power to be fruitful. You and I have the capacity the potential, the ability by God's help and with his grace to, to grow through this thing called 2020, <laughs> even in Melbourne. Whatever twists and turns this year takes, we have God's strength and ability to grow and to be fruitful. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. The branch needs the roots and the vine. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. If we abide in God like Joseph fellowship with his God, communed with him all those years, then we can know fruitfulness. Peter says uh, in the first chapter of his first letter, in verse 6 and 7, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have grieved, you've been grieved by various trials. Peter says that our trials are for a little while. Look, it may be years, but compared to eternity, that is a little while. And trials are necessary, Peter says, if need be. The trials God sends are only necessary ones. You know, Peter does distinguish between real godly suffering and suffering because of our sinful choices. They're not the same. They're not the same. And so chastening can come because of our real disobedience. But there is a suffering that comes because we are believers in this world and the world hated Christ that hates believers. So in every suffering we have as God's children is because of our faith. It may be because we've done the wrong thing. P Peter distinguishes those two things. But even where there is suffering because of bad choices we made and we've all made them, if we're willing to repent, God can help us forgive and restore. That's a wonderful truth. And so... Verse 53 to 55 through to 57 talks about how the, the seven wonderful years come to an end, just as Joseph predicted. They do come to an end. And it says in verse 54, the famine was in all lands. It's everywhere. 
outside of Egypt and also in Egypt. But in Egypt, there is bread. And it says, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Feed me, feed me, feed me. We've heard that at home if you've got little kids. Feed me. Dad, I'm hungry. Mum, I'm hungry. Feed me. That's what the people are doing to Pharaoh. And you know, he says to the Egyptians, go to Joseph. You're hungry? Go to him. Don't come to me. Go to Joseph. And so they do. And notice how bad this famine is. Verse 56, the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt is a contrast to the incredible abundance of the first seven years. I mean, 57. So all countries come to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Just as earlier on, chapter 41 says, there's abundance, 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 abundance. Then in the seven bad years, it is, it's severe, it's bad, it's terrible, it's shocking, it's awful. You got the contrast. Now here is what is really interesting. Five times we're told about the famine being so severe. Do you know on, on other occasions in Egypt, there were, there were recorded famines. People resorted to cannibalism. Cannibalism. Now, when a society reduces itself to cannibalism, you can be rest assured there is anarchy. Anarchy. And so it's very important that when countries go through difficulties, food shortages, economic challenges, uh, you know, a lot of countries, they, 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 they're going to try and do their best to look after its populations because the alternative is ultimately starvation, poverty and anarchy. And that's expensive to fix. It's usually too late by then. So there is incredible severity and famine in Egypt, plus all the other surrounding countries, including Canaan. No one is getting rain anymore. All that abundant rain of those seven years has stopped. But here is the genius of Joseph. Think about what Joseph is able to do with God's help in those first seven years. And then, of course, the seven bad years. He harnesses the good years. He makes the most of the great years. Nothing is wasted. It's all stored. Well, there's 20% of those seven abundant years are stored. He can feed Egypt during the famine. He can feed Pharaoh's people. The harvest is so abundant that he can feed other nations. So these, these seven years of savings is enough not only to look after Egypt, but also other nations. That's how abundant the harvest is. But lastly, he's able to enrich Egypt because people are paying Egypt money outside to buy this grain. Joseph has done the miraculous, almost. To survive a famine and to feed other nations and also to be paid to do that. I mean, Egypt, this was not some humanitarian um, effort. This was pay us money, we give you grain. Of course, people appreciate what they pay for, do they not? Rather than just, it's a handout. God is wonderfully blessing Joseph. We see the blessing of God, not just on Egypt, but on other nations. Previously, the blessing of God is on Potiphar's house, upon the prison. Now it extends to Egypt and all the world. The blessing of God on everyone. Think about Genesis 12. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. That promise of God is being or, or begins to be fulfilled. That's not the end of the promise. It's the beginning. Joseph blesses all. And friends, I must tell you today about the cross of Jesus Christ. Because at the cross of Christ, all nations of the earth were blessed. Think about the cross of Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross, there was an inscription written in Greek, Latin, Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Greek, Latin, Hebrew. Anyone who walked past the cross could read in one of those languages. Jesus, though king of the Jews, 
is saviour also of Gentiles. He's saviour of men and women throughout all ages, throughout all people groups. He is, as John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God that was slain to take away the sins of the world. And so today, we have the blessing of Jesus Christ upon us if we've received him by faith. The incredible benefits of the cross of Christ upon all who will believe, upon all who will come to him by faith. May God help us to forget some of our earlier burdens and afflictions. May God lighten the load of our present afflictions. May God give us fruitfulness and blessing as we serve him despite our afflictions. Amen. Benediction for this morning's service comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, 
to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus in all generations forever and ever. Amen.